Good morning, church. So, my t topic is selflessness. Now, that is a hard topic to talk on because we like to be selfish, don't we? I know I like to be selfish. It's easier to be selfish, but as Christians, we're called to be selfless. And so, it's a hard message to give. I'm sorry in advance. Someone told me at 8.30. It's like, I didn't actually like your message because it's hard. So, um, I apologise up to you now. It is a challenging message, but it's, a, it's also an empowering message too. So, when I was reflecting in my early 20s, I was reflecting on my childhood, and I, and I realised that my mum, the way she raised me in a particular way was quite, it's a bit funny, really. And you, you do that, as I guess, when you get into your teenage years, young adults, you start reflecting on life and you realise some of the ways you were raised may not have been the best way. Um, and that's a good way, it's a, it's a natural process of, of growing up. So what happened is when I was a child, I remember my, my friends would come over, get this, my friends would come over and my mum, before they'd come over, they would say, mum would say, uh, when it's polite when your friends come over, that you just do the things that they want to do, okay? So if they want to play Lego, you play Lego. If they want to play uh, PlayStation, play PlayStation. If they want to play sport, go and play sport. Uh, that's the way you can be a good host. It's polite to do that. So I thought, all right, well, fair enough, I'll do that. But then, <laughs> this is where the system didn't seem right. When I would then go to my friend's house, I remember, my mum would say in the car, now, Adrian, you're going to someone else's house. It's actually quite polite to just do the things <laughs> that your friends want to do. So I went to my friends and I still had to do the things my friends wanted to do. It wasn't, it didn't seem right, but that's what I kind of did. And so I realised as you kind of grow up, my mum kind of trained me to be passive when dealing with friends. To kind of just do what your friends want to do. Don't kind of stick up with to the things that you want to do. It's actually good to be assertive. It's not good to be passive. And I want to kind of encourage us right at the beginning. Selflessness doesn't mean to be passive. Okay? That's not what selflessness is. You should assert the things that you need to... Um, that you need sometimes. And sometimes you forgo it. That's just a part of life. Uh, but selflessness, though, um, unfortunately, is actually more uncomfortable sometimes than being passive. And so that's what we're going to look at today as we dive into the Bible. So today we're going to look at a passage in Mark 8. So if you have your Bibles there, um, you can get into Mark 8. We're going to start in verse 22. Mark 8, 22. So, here we go. Now, the context is Jesus is going about his ministry and he goes to different villages and people come to him who are um, sick, obviously. So, let's um, get into it. So, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a man, a blind man, and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit... Now, this is weird. No, we have to acknowledge this is weird. <laughs> when he we had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, this is the blind man, I see people, they look like trees walking around. So once that when we're looking at the person of Jesus, Mark has put this passage, this particular healing, in the right spot, because he's wanting to tell us something. When looking at the person of Jesus, there are some of us here today that are virtually blind. So 
Some of us have blurry vision, and some of us can see clearly. The way we see Jesus determines the way we see discipleship. The way we see discipleship determines how we act. If you consider yourself a Christian today, then discipleship is critically important. So the rest of this passage is going to be talking to us about who the Messiah is and what discipleship means. So let's keep moving. Mark uh, 8, if we just uh, click over to the next slide. Mark 8, 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages. On the way, he asked them, on the way. Now, on the way, it says in Mark, a lot of times, on the way. Jesus was on the way somewhere and his disciples followed him. It, as a Christian, we follow Jesus. We're on the way with Jesus somewhere. It's a really important concept. We're heading in the same direction as Jesus is heading, on the way. So on the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So it's kind of this, it's almost like this idea of a reincarnation kind of idea, like Jesus is reincarnated. Um, But it's not exactly like that. Elijah is a a particular individual that that the Jewish people kept on thinking Elijah's going to come back at some point because he didn't actually die. If we know the story, Elijah actually got taken up to heaven. He didn't experience death. And so the the Jewish people were were thinking, well, Elijah will come back at some point, um, and that's a part of the story. And so it's not really reincarnation. Uh, but, um, so that's what Jesus is asking. Who do you think people, or who do people say I am? And then he goes, but what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Now, anyone in this room today, if you have some, some sort of relationship with God, or if you want to have some sort of relationship with God, at some point in your journey, because all our journeys are different, but at some point in our journey you'll be asked these two questions by Jesus. Who do people say I am and who do you think I am? And it's important what we think. Um, The people in your family, your people, your friends, people at school, people at work, they will have an opinion of who Jesus is. But who do you think Jesus is? And the two ideas might actually be different. Society thinks Jesus is something or someone. We need to think about very clearly who Jesus is. And it, may, it is definitely, it's definitely different to what society says. And so these two questions, we're all asked these two questions. Now, what does Peter say? Peter answers, well, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Now, the word Messiah is a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word basically means the anointed one. And the word Christ is the Greek word, which means the same thing. So when we say Messiah, when we say Christ, we're saying the same thing, it's the anointed one. All right, so that's the idea. uh, Peter's saying, well, you are the anointed one. You're the one. You're the one that God is going to bring to us to restore Israel. And this is a very fundamental idea that we need to get our heads around because it, this idea then explains why Peter acts a, diff- a certain way and Jesus acts a certain way when we keep going in this passage. So just so we can, we're all very clear what this Messiah is. Peter, he doesn't, we know kind of what the Messiah means. We know, well, Jesus Christ died for our sins. We know that as Christians. Even if you're not a Christian here today, you kind of, you know the story that Jesus died. Uh, but Peter has a very specific idea of what the Messiah is. Basically, in the history of Israel, uh, 500, 600 years before Christ um, came to earth, Israel had a piece of land, the promised land, Israel. And it's still there today, Israel. They had that piece of land and they had total control over it, political control. um, And it was a promise. It's a promised land. God promised them that they would have this land. And about 586 BC, I think it was, the Babylonians came, this massive superpower, like 
kind of the USA of today, a massive superpower, came and took over this land. And that was prophesied. The prophets came and said, if you, Israel, these, these people of God, the children of, um, of God, God uh, it was prophesied, if you don't clean up your act, you will be judged. And that judgment's going to look like Babylon coming and taking over this, your promised land. And so, and they didn't clean up their act, it kept happening. They kept on kind of doing the things they weren't meant to do. And so they were judged and they lost the land. And so if we click up over to the next slide, we, the maps aren't too clear there, but on the one on the left, there's two maps here. The one on the left is the Babylonian Empire that was spread out. And you can kind of see what parallel to the Mediterranean Sea there is, the, is Israel. And the Babylonian Empire came out and kind of took out Israel to, um, in two stages, uh, Syria was first, but the Babylonian Empire came out, took over Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and the, ch the children of God could no longer live in their land, and they definitely didn't have control over the land. Once that's happened, that Babylon was the, the superpower, at some point Persia came along, the Persia's on the right-hand side, and they came along and they kind of spread out, defeated the Babylonians, and they spread out, and you can see, if you kind of can see, Israel's there, and the Persians took out all of Israel, and again, the Persians had a different kind of philosophy. They let the Jews come back, and so the, the Jews were allowed to live in the land of Israel, but they didn't have political control. And this is the important point. They didn't have political control. They were able to live in the land, but they didn't have political control. Now, Persia, if you've seen the movie 300, has anyone seen that bloody movie 300? It's a great movie. I wouldn't recommend it at the moment, <laughs> you guys. Um, but that's the Persians coming and having their big battle with the Spartans and the Athenians. And it's a great movie. But those are the Persians. Now, after the Persians came along, they kind of got stopped by the Greeks. And at some point, the Greeks, they became the next superpower. So if we quickly go to the next map. They became the next superpower. So that's where Alexander the Great came. And he, his empire became even bigger than the Persians ever was. But you can kind of see again, Israel... The Greeks had that land. They had it politically. The Jews were still living in it, but they didn't have any control over it. And so that, um, and that's very important. Now, this period of time was between the New Testament and Old Testament. It was kind of that during that time, the Bible itself doesn't talk about it, but we got heaps of history that says Israel was possessed with, um, from the Greeks and they didn't have control. And then if we, we know the story, after that, the Romans kind of came along. So if we look at the Romans, the Romans had this huge empire. By 117, they had uh, this huge land. But during the time of Jesus, the Romans had this particular land called Israel. The Jews could live in it, but they didn't have political control. So during this time, around when the Greeks had it and the Romans had it, there was this idea that this Messiah, this anointed one, this Christ would come, God would send this Messiah to destroy that political power that was over, overshadowing the, um, the people of God, and then that the Israelites could have full possession of their land like they did in the, um, with David and, and, with, and Solomon. And so that's the Messiah, that's Peter. The whole point of the Messiah is that he will come with a sword and he will defeat the Romans. But that's not what Jesus came and did, did he? He had a totally different message. So when, G when Peter said, you are the Messiah, he had this um, battle, battle Jesus, warrior Jesus in his head. And so this is why Jesus said, if we look at um, what, what he said, the way he responded was, when Peter answered, you are the Messiah, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone because he knew, they, they, he knew that everyone had this idea. Um, and so it's very important that um, Jesus took it very seriously that this idea of messiahship, people knew what that meant because what you think about messiahship directly relates to what you think about discipleship. Okay, it's the two are very connected, and Jesus explains that here. So, and it's all through Mark. 
Mark, Jesus, all through Mark, wants to hide his, this idea of being the Messiah. It's called the, the messianic secret. It happens all the time because he takes it so seriously. So what does Jesus do after that? In Mark 8, 31, he goes on and he actually does talk about this is what the Messiah will do. This is the idea of the Messiah you need to have. Uh, so if we click back, you know, just go through the maps, that's fine. Um, here we go, beautiful. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man, this Messiah, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. This is totally opposite, isn't it? Jesus was meant to come and kill the Romans, but this idea, Jesus is now saying he's going to be killed by the Romans. It's the opposite. And this is where Jesus, the pedo had, he just didn't, this did not compute. This did not, it just didn't make sense to him. And so Peter, when he heard this, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Rebuke Jesus. Just like Jesus began to teach about the Messiah... Peter now began to rebuke. Peter took on the role of teacher. Peter took the role of Lord and said, this is not the way it is, Jesus. How often do we do that? How often do I, I do it all the time. God, this is not the way that God is meant to like, act. This is not how it's meant to be. The way that the life, this, my life is going at the moment, it's not the right way, God. It's just to let you know, it's not the right way. It's, we do it so often, and Peter's doing it at this moment. Not only that, is Peter, this word rebuke, the word rebuke here is a, it's describing the manner in which Peter is speaking. The way he's rebuking Jesus is the same way as you would rebuke a demon. So Peter, in his mind, is thinking, Jesus is saying something demonic, and I need to rebuke that. What his, his, because of his idea of the Messiah, what, Pe what Jesus is saying is evil, and it needs to be rebuked. That's, this is why it's so serious. That it's so, what Jesus is saying is so radical, uh, and so, what did then Jesus do when he was rebuked by Peter? Let's look, let's keep going. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the mind, uh, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. It's such a harsh reply, isn't it? He uses the word rebuke. So, Jesus is now was saying, no, you are the one who's saying demonic-like things. But he goes on and says, you are being like Satan. You are Satan at this moment. That is pretty... <laughs> this is... Jesus is taking it very, very seriously. So why did he take it so seriously? Why did he... Have, he, he he responded in such a harsh manner. It's because he took messiahship extremely seriously and he would not back down. But also, Peter was giving, get this, Peter was giving Jesus an out. Peter was saying, whoa, you don't have to die. You don't actually need to suffer, be rejected and get killed. There's another way. And so, in this act, it feels a bit strange, but in this act, with Jesus rebuking Peter, Jesus is actually acting selflessly because he knows that the path that he needs to take is the hardest one. It's actually the hardest one to take. It would have been easier, it's hard to fathom, but it would have been easier for Jesus to defeat the Romans and kick them out and let Israel actually live in their land. But it, he, the hardest path was to actually submit himself to death. And so in the act of this rebuke, he's actually acting selflessly. Um, That's um, a really important um, point. So this path that Jesus needed to take was obviously terribly hard. 
And sometimes being selfless means we must take that hard path, not for ourselves, but for the sake of others. And this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Jesus goes on to tell his followers what disciple really, discipleship really means. Let's uh, click to the next one. Then he called the crowds. He was just with the disciples, now he's calling the crowds. Everyone needs to know this. This is, the, this is what discipleship means. If you actually want to follow Jesus, this is what discipleship means. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is such a challenging idea because sometimes as Christians, we just want to take the easy path, don't we? We all as humans just want to be comfortable. But Jesus is saying to be a disciple, you need to take the hardest path. Shivers, this is hard. (laughs) So if you want to be selfless, if you want to be a disciple, you need to deny yourself. You need, we need to pick up our cross and we need to follow Jesus. So we, let's unpack this for a bit. And I'm going to go in a funny direction, but I think, yeah, I, I like it. Um, so we need, what does deny ourselves mean? We need to deny our bodies sometimes. We need to deny our minds sometimes. We need to deny our emotions sometimes. This is what deny being, like denying means. If we need to deny our body sometimes, we need to work out what the body does. If we examine the body, there are just countless systems within our bodies which keep us alive. It's obvious, isn't it? It keeps us alive. All these systems, most of them, all of them, are unconscious. We can just sit and we are living because of all of these systems, and most of them are unconscious. So for the last, say, 20 minutes, you're all sitting here, you've all been breathing, but you've not even thought about breathing not once. You've just been breathing. But now as I'm talking, and I'm talking about your breathing, you're now, oh, I am breathing. Oh, I need a couple of deep breaths. We, can, we switch, we go from unconscious to conscious, we can switch. Another cool example of this, when we can actually become conscious of what our body does, here's one, I want everyone to do this one. We can, we've got different ways of moving our eyes, our eye movements are different. So if you, I want everyone to do it, just have, as you're looking at the stage, look from left to right, just track your eyes, just Look, go from here to here, look at your eyes, like, you just move your eyes across, don't move your head, move your eyes, and consciously think, what are those movements like? What are those movements like? You can go right to left if you want, what are they, what does it, what's happening? And then, now I want everyone, get your finger and stick in front of your face. Now do the same thing, don't move your head, but follow your finger and then consciously think, what are my eyes doing now? And you can, can't, you can tell there's two different ways your eyes move, isn't there? When you're just tracking things just across the stage, your eyes movements are probably fast, fairly rigid, jerky. Um, where when you're tracking something, it's smooth, slow and focused. And that's happening just unconsciously. And there's a reason for that. As we're moving around life, moving our head, you got, your eyes need to move quickly and keep, to keep everything still. But when we want to follow something, it can go slowly and focus. All of that, these systems are in place to keep you alive, to keep you from threat. There's a, that's the whole point. There's a whole section of your brain just dedicated to keep you alive internally, to keep your systems running, but also the whole point of us having those in our brain, this part of the brain, is to keep us from threat. That's the way God has designed us. But the fascinating thing about humans is that we also have an entirely different part of our brain which makes us conscious. We can actually stop and voluntarily think about what we're doing. So as I'm getting you to look at your silly finger, you can think about what you're actually doing. You're conscious in that. You can actually think about what you're thinking. Animals cannot do that. 
humans can. We can think about what you're thinking. That part of your brain is at the front, and it's called the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex. And it's the part of the brain that's responsible for thinking through things, for reasoning, for planning ahead, for kind of checking your actions and thinking through the consequences. Now, here's a, it's a, I think it's a fun fact. I've, when I learned this, it explained everything about me. This part of this brain, this prefrontal cortex, is the last part of the brain to fully develop, especially in males. <laughs> Get this. The decision-making of your brain, boys, doesn't fully develop until 24. And so this explains a lot of things, doesn't it? If you have a teenage boy in your house, if, even if you have a 21-year-old boy in your house, they sometimes act like boys because that decision-making part of their brain isn't fully developed. The part of that, that unconscious part of your brain is the thing that's driving you the thing that doesn't actually think of, that there's a future. The unconscious part of your brain is it's just today. It's just right now. It's just keeping you alive. It's the thing that's keeping you from danger. It's the thing that wants you to gratify your desires instantly. That, that back part of your brain. The, the frontal part, the frontal cortex is the thing that will stop you doing stupid things. <laughs> and boys don't develop. So... Yeah, you got an excuse, boys, all right? You've got an excuse. <laughs> all right. So we have unconscious, live-in-the-moment systems, and we have conscious, think-of-the-future systems. When Jesus tells us to deny ourselves, sometimes we need to deny each system. Sometimes some, an instant thought will come, and it's biological, but we need to deny that. Sometimes, when, when a, females too, but when males see something of beauty, chemicals, bang, straight happens in your brain, and it's not even conscious. Things start ticking through, start, things start moving around in your brain to get stuff happening, and it's not even conscious. As humans, and especially as Christians, we need to deny that part of us sometimes, don't we? It keeps everything running smoothly in the world when we deny that part of us. But sometimes we might need to actually deny the conscious part as well. Sometimes we might consciously think about something in the future that you might want or strategically go, well, if I do that, then that person's going to feel like that and I want them to feel like that because I'm angry with them. And we sometimes need to, def the, the, we need to deny that part as well. We need to deny both systems. Is there something in your life that you need to deny? Either something immediate or a future goal. Not so that you can be miserable. Jesus doesn't just want you to be miserable. Deny everything and be miserable. It's not that. Sometimes we need to deny ourselves for the sake of others. We need to deny ourselves for the bigger picture and that's what selflessness is about. The second part is take up your cross. For Peter and the disciples, the idea of the cross is very real. For us today, we know this cross, most of us would know, it's an execution, or how are you saying? Execution device, sorry. Execution device. We, we, it's, it's really designed to bring about the most pain possible as long as possible. We know that. But we, it's an abstract thought. We don't actually know it. We've never seen it. We've, none of us here have seen someone get crucified. I'm pretty sure. But for the disciples, for Peter, this is a real reality. They, the, Peter and the disciples, anywhere that the Romans had control, crucifixion was a reality, a regular reality. So when Jesus is saying, pick up your cross, he's actually saying, you need to be willing to get crucified. It was a terrible fate. But if the, get this, if the disciples, some of these, Peter was crucified. If the early disciples weren't willing 
to pick up their cross, to deny themselves and pick up their cross, none of us here would, none of us would be here. The gospel's message would not have spread and it wouldn't happen. And so when we look at these disciples, it's amazing. Thank God that Jesus died for our sins, but thank God that those early disciples were willing to deny themselves and pick up their cross. When I look at my life, this is amazingly challenging. There's just no comparison between my discipleship and their discipleship. But we need to fast forward to today because there is a message in this for us. And if we're thinking about reality, there's a slim chance that for us today, we're going to get killed for our faith in Adelaide. It is a slim chance. I can't say it's not going to happen, but it's a slim chance. Most of us aren't going to die because of our faith. It's happening right now today in the world, but in Adelaide, it's probably not going to happen. But this message is still very, very relevant for us. But what does it mean? It's taken me a while to kind of get my head around what this could mean. In Luke's gospel, when he's talking about this event, this, uh, this conversation that Jesus is having, he adds the word, Luke adds the word daily. You need to pick up your cross daily. It should be a regular occurrence. There is an aspect of this which means we need to pick up and deal with the thing inside of us that should die. We should pick up that thing that should die in us, that addiction, that spite, that unforgiveness, that greed, that pride, that thing that is causing us to die internally anyway, we need to pick that thing up and let it die so that we can then live a life that we're meant to live. Um, And so that's what this, I think that's what this idea means for us today. Is there something in your life that you have been ignoring which should be addressed? Humans are constant procrastinators. We, we just procrastinate, don't we? How often do we procrastinate about, uh, procrastinate about schoolwork? How often? We do it. We like to just put it off and put it off and put it off. Housework, put it off. Going to the dentist, put it off. Those kind of things we like. Go, going for a run, put it off. We like to put these things off. But we also like to put other things off. There are some things in our life that bring us and and others a certain amount of suffering, but it's easier for us to ignore than actually pick it up and deal with. There might be a monster inside of you, which if you ignore that, like all monsters, it will only get bigger until you deal with it. You don't have to live long. We're all of us, this is relevant for every single one of us. If you're in relationships with any kind, if you have some sort of close relationship, you know that at some point conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. And sometimes that conflict is a good thing. It's necessary. But so often I find in relationships, we sometimes, we want to put off that inevitable conflict We don't want to have that hard conversation because it's too uncomfortable, so we just ignore it. We put it to one side, and the longer we do that, the underlying issues are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and sometimes, and that conversation will then happen, and it'll be way worse than if you have just dealt with it at the beginning. This principle in life is throughout every part of life, finances, health, relationships, stuff at school, stuff at work. It happens. We, the things that are in our life that we just need to pick up and deal with, the longer we put it off, the worse it's going to get. So we should just pick that thing up. What aspects of your life cause you, to, cause you discomfort, but you might just need to address it now? What do you need to pick up? What do you need to embrace and feel the weight of suffering that it brings to you? And what do you need to take responsibility for? Because get this, when, when we don't deal with these practical things, or may, let's say, to flip it, when we do 
deal with these practical things in our life, just dealing with the small things that we just need to sort out in our lives. It is a part of your life and my life that's just a mess. <laughs> it is a mess. And when we don't deal with that thing, it causes a whole bunch of people around us to go through suffering as well. And so when we pick that up and deal with it, then the people around us have an easier life as well. So this is a really practical thing for you and for the people around you. But one thing I'd really want to add here, though, is sometimes there's suffering in our life and we've got nothing to do with it. It's not our fault that it's, we are experiencing it. And that suffering, this is where it, this is it's so challenging, but I think it's really powerful for us, is that suffering, the things that we're experiencing that you might be experiencing right now, or you have, or you definitely will, because life is pain, isn't it? There's pain in life. If you're not experiencing right now, you will. There's pain in life. It's a terrible thing. It's so pessimistic, but there is. There's some suffering that you might be dealing with right now, and if you can pick that suffering up, not get over it, not um, deal with, not kind of um, just dismiss, but pick that suffering up in our life, feel the weight, adjust to that weight, and follow Jesus anyway. That, I think, is a very, very powerful message. That is just, it just blows your mind that despite that suffering that we go through, you're going to follow Jesus anyway. You're going to head in the direction that he's heading in. And he, yes, he headed towards death, but he also headed towards resurrection. And when we follow that path, we head towards resurrection too. And ultimately, he headed towards the reality of the kingdom of God. And so often we need to check ourselves. Are we heading towards the reality of the kingdom of God in our lives? Because I don't know about you, but so often I head in the direction of the kingdom of Adrian. <laughs> we do it, don't we? We head into the kingdom of Adrian, that thing, either a financial kingdom, some kind of weird power kingdom, a work promotion kingdom. We head in those, some of those things are good things, but if we base our whole life, is that the sole direction that we're heading in, we're going down the wrong path. And we're probably going to be messing a whole bunch of stuff up as we're heading down that path. So this is this really, it's a hard message, but man, it's a good one because it's, it, this is what discipleship means. And I think this is what, this, it's a paradox. In verse 35, here we go. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. This idea of life, the word is kind of soul personhood, who I am, everything that means me, who I am. Jesus is saying, you need to give that up, but in doing that, you're also going to receive life. And so when we deny ourselves, when we pick up our cross, and when we follow Jesus, we're shaking off the stuff, that it, the, the part of our lives that we shouldn't be, and we're receiving the parts that we should be. And that's a really powerful message for all of us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much that you sent your Son. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you were willing to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and ultimately head for death. But thank you so much that then because you did that, everyone in this room can now have a relationship with the Father. That because you were selfless, we can now be able to receive life from you. So I pray for everyone in this room right now, I pray that we can stop just for a second, be conscious of our life, and actually just think through our life right now. Help us speak to us right now. 
is there something that we need to deny? Is there something that we need to pick up and deal with? And is there a direction that we need to stop going down so we can actually start following you towards the kingdom of God? So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.